ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد and today inshallah uh, we'll be concluding my series of talks on looking at this islamic spirituality and how what does it have to offer to the world? What does it have to offer to the world and the Muslims today? Spirituality, we said, any spiritual experience, the essence of it, the essence of it is love. The essence of it, this blissful feeling that comes with the spirituality, the essence of it is love. And we said love is at the heart of who we are as human beings. Our souls, at the heart of them is love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what we are created for, that's what we are designed for. We are designed, we created to worship Allah and we said the essence of worship is love, is loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what the essence of worship means. So, what does spirituality have to offer today? One of the most important aspects of spirituality that it is inherently ethical. All the Husnul Khuluq that we talk about in Islam, good character, as Sidq, truthfulness, honesty, Al Amana, trustworthiness, courage, Shaja'a, generosity, Karam, decency, Al Iffa, patience, Sabr, uh, good will, Niyat Al Khair, or Iradat Al Khair, or Al Nasiha. All of these, where, they do they, where do they come from? They come from our souls. The soul is essentially, is essentially ethical. You don't need to teach your soul truthfulness because it knows it, that's its nature. You don't need to teach your soul mercy because the nature of the soul is that it is merciful. You don't need to teach your soul giving and generosity because that's the essence of the soul. And this is why our fitrah is strongly linked to the soul. And in the fitrah, everything is good. So it, this has implications. First, it has implications in raising our children. Oftentimes, we think we need to teach our kids good akhlaq. We imagine our kids as empty vessels and we need to put in them or pour in them akhlaq. So as if they are empty, Okay, they are a blank slate and we need to write on them or encrypt in them akhlaq. So they have no clue about akhlaq. They are essentially, they don't know truthfulness, they don't know honesty, they don't know mercy, they don't know love. We need to bring thing, these things from outside and put them in our kids, instill them in our kids. And that's essentially faulty. Because it assumes that human beings are essentially flawed that humans are essentially unethical and you need to transform this unethical nature and make it more ethical. And that goes against the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمُ We've created man in the best format. That means format, physical format as a shape and emotional format, spiritual format, ethical format, everything about us, we are born in, a, in the best state. But what we need to do is help the state to unfold and manifest itself and grow. So this is why children, they have mercy. You don't, you don't need to teach them mercy. A child as a child, they don't, they don't know what lying is. They know only truthfulness. They only pick it up from a young age when they see people lying. Or when they are frightened, when they are frightened, in order to escape, they think of the lie as an escape, as a defense mechanism. That's when they come face to face with lying. But a, a child, if a child has never been exposed to lying, or has never been put in a, in a place where they actually fear for their safety, they don't even know what lying is. It doesn't even occur to them. So essentially humans are truthful. So this is why spirituality has this great advantage. It assumes that we humans are ethical already. We have husnul khuluq. But what happens, we grow out of it in early years because of the influence of the society, influence of the school, influence of the parents, influence of the family 
atmosphere and so on and so forth. So people lose this purity and this ethical nature. That makes parenting so easy. So this is why when parents usually ask the question, how can I teach my kids to be truthful? <laughs> they already know, you don't have to teach them. That makes it easy for you. All you have to do is get out of their way, don't teach them lying. Don't put them in a position where they need to lie in order to survive, in order to protect themselves. That's all you need to do. And then you don't, ha you don't have to teach them uh, truthfulness. How can I teach my uh, students to be, or my students or my, uh, my kids to be respectful? Kids are respectful by nature. So where does misbehavior and disrespect come from? It comes as a defense mechanism comes as a defense mechanism. When the child is not comfortable, the child is not being treated at home well, the child is being treated disrespectfully by the parents for a good reason. I want him to learn Salah. I want him to learn Quran. So what do I do? I tell him off. I violate his dignity because he's done, he's, he lied. He said something that wasn't true. And by the way, kids imagine. So they tell you their imagination and you think they're lying. So you take them seriously from a young age, two, three years old. He's lying. How come you lie? You smack them, right? You tell them off. The child sees his dignity has been violated. Now that's his first encounter with disrespect. Then second encounter and so on and so forth until the child lost their original nature where respect is the default setting. Is the default setting in human beings, respect. But because he's been mistreated all these years, younger years, now he learned how to be disrespectful. You gave him enough exposure. So this is the advantage of spirituality. True spirituality is ethical or in, in nature. We are ethical in nature in our spirit. So if we are able to reset the spirituality button, so to speak, bring our children, bring our younger generation and our older generations as well back to their spiritual nature, back to their souls automatically people are going to be good the soul, and this is why in, in the Quran you will find Allah never talks bad about the soul Allah never talks bad about the soul every time a ruh is mentioned, is mentioned in a respectful manner, in a, in, a, in a very praiseworthy manner. Even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about ar ruh he, he refers it, he ascribes it to himself. He talks about Adam, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِهِ And he blew in him from his soul. That doesn't mean the soul of Allah, but it means Allah created a soul from him. He created a soul and he gave it to Adam. He blew it into Adam. So it's a creation. But Allah refers to the soul, and this is what called, what's called in Arabic, إِضَافَةُ tashrif. It's referred or attributed to Allah for for honor and dig to dignify it and show its status with Allah. As Allah SWT says, Baytullah, the house of Allah. It's attributed to Allah to give it honor and respect and status. So when Allah says, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مَنْ رُوحِهِ Allah didn't say, وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ الروح. He didn't say, and he blew into him the soul. No, he said, he blew into him from his soul. Why did Allah refer it to himself? To show its dignity and its status. So every time Allah talks about a ruh and the Prophet ﷺ talks about a ruh is, is respected. The only time there's a condemnation or a negative sense, a nafs is mentioned, the self, the ego is mentioned. So a ruh is always mentioned positive. Why? Because a ruh is essentially good, is essentially beautiful. And this is why when we are born in a state of fitrah, in a pure state. So when we are born, what are we given? Our, our nafs is empty, there's nothing in it now. وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِنْ بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا in Surah Al-Nahl Allah has brought you from your, the wombs of your mothers you know nothing that means yourself is empty still it's a system that is empty you're gonna fill it up what are you born with then? you're born with your soul so because you're born with your soul and it's pure you are born in a state of fitrah essentially is everything good and this is why humanity shares all of humanity agrees that justice is better than oppression, right? Regardless of religion. Even those who com commit oppression, they don't call it oppression. They call it justice. And from their perspective, it seems justice. All of humanity agrees that justice is good. All of them agree that courage is good. All of them agree that respect is good. These are universal principles. Why? Because they are part of the fitrah, connected. They come from the soul. 
the essence that we all share, all of humanity shares. So this is why all you, you go to the Chinese, they agree on these principles. You go to uh, Russians, they agree on these principles. Go in the depths of the jungles of Africa, people agree on these principles. Go to Europe, the same principles. To the Americas, North America, South America, same principles. Australia, same principles. The Arab world, same principles. Persia, same principles. Everyone agrees on this, regardless of their time, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their language. Who, 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 de who ever says, who dares says that uh, respect is, is, is not good? No one says. And if they say it, it's more of a bluff. They don't mean it. If someone is upset because they've respected people and they were taken advantage of, uh, advantage of, they might say, you know, don't respect people, they don't deserve it. So respect is not a good thing. But that's out of anger. But in reality, in our hearts, we know that respect is good. We know that justice is good. We know that courage is good. We know that generosity is good. We know that forgiveness is good. We know that mercy is good. We know that empathy is good. Everyone knows that. Everyone agrees on this, regardless. So this shows that spirituality in essence is ethical and to make it a bit more practical you want to teach someone good akhlaq good ethics okay you can't tell them see this is how you do these things they're not going to teach they're not going to learn it teach your kid to say this is how you you know are truthful you do this you do that it doesn't work like this it has to come from the heart because this, this is where it resides. So essentially, we humans are ethical. We are ethical in our souls and our spirits. So if someone wants to become more ethical, all they need to do is awaken that spiritual side of who they are. And automatically, you'll find yourself more merciful, more empathetic towards others. You'll find yourself appreciating justice, equality or equity, respect. You'll find yourself appreciating others, you find yourself tending to forgive others, you, you find yourself tending to help out others, because that's essential, so spirituality is essentially ethical. So it plays a very vital role in our ethical development, in our ethical repertoire as human beings. You want to develop, tap into your soul, tap into your spiritual side, ethics, Good akhlaq are not technical. You cannot learn them in the lab. You cannot learn them in a workshop. You cannot. But you can be reminded of them. You can be reminded of them intellectually. You can be reminded of them. But they are the essence of humanity. This is why, you know, look at those, some, of, some of those viral videos on social media. A lot of them, what makes them go viral? Because they have this human element in them, right? Someone helping another human being, a weak person. Someone helping a homeless guy. Someone helping an animal, a dog, a cat. Someone helping a bird that's stuck, and so on and so forth. Or a moment of generosity. A moment of selflessness, right? A lot of these, the videos that go viral, these are the elements of, in them. What makes them go viral? What makes them get so much attention and appreciation from people? They resonate with their soul, they resonate with their nature, everyone loves this. Everyone appreciates these ethical principles and love to see them manifested in the world. Why? Because they awaken who we are as spiritual human beings. And what, like some of those videos, what are, what are they called, like some of the titles? Restoring Faith in Humanity. Imagine, imagine how generally people in our common sense, general culture today, how people look at ethical principles, they call them what? Humanity. Humanity. And that's what we, to, what we call fitrah in Islam. That's what we call fitrah. So this selflessness, this uh, attitude of helping out, this kind of generosity, this kind of respect, this kind of giving, this kind of you know, forgiveness, this kind, whatever is ethical within Islam, Okay, truthfulness, that you are truthful with someone, everyone appreciates this. And when you see someone who's truthful against the odds and they tell the truth regardless, straight away the level of respect and admiration to this person is going to soar in your heart. 
Why? Because it resonates with your soul, resonates with your fitrah. So, spirituality, I would say, is the main tool in restoring husnul khuluq, instilling husnul khuluq within ourselves. You cannot teach a person husnul khuluq, you cannot teach them. You can simply awaken it within them. Because humans are born essentially with husnul khuluq, but they lose it, they lose it with the conditioning of parenting, of education, of cultural, culturalization and so on and so forth. That's how humans lose it. So you want to become more ethical, you want to find husnul khuluq, look inside. Tap into your soul, you're going to find it there. It's not about hard work, it's not about doing exercises, it's not about, as I said, you know, you can't develop it in the lab. It doesn't, it doesn't work like this. Ethical principles are within you. And this is why they are contagious. So when you see someone is helpful, straight away you are drawn into it and you want to do the same. It's contagious. Why? Not because you are a copycat, but because that when you see this, you recognize yourself in it. When you see this kindness, this selflessness, or a, or a person who acts in a courageous way in a difficult situation, that reminds you of who you really are in your essence, in your soul. So you want to be like this. So it's not an act of mimicking, it's an act of awakening who you are. So that's the first principle. Spirituality is ethical in essence and it's the only source of our husnul khuluq. It's the only source. So if we truly want to develop husnul khuluq, we have to tap into our spiritual side. We have to develop spiritually. And we said the essence of spirituality, the essence of spirituality, the truth of it, this blissful feeling, this state, this powerful state of serenity and uh, being centeredness and satisfaction and fulfillment. Where does it come from? It comes from embracing the essence of who we are, love. Love for the Creator or for the source of all being. Love for our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then we need this love to unfold and manifest itself in all our daily affairs, in everything we do. So that's the first thing. So that's an advantage for spirituality. This one thing that spirituality can offer us. Number two, I hinted on this just five minutes ago. Spirituality is universal. It's universal. You look at all religions, they all seek spirituality. They seek spiritual experiences. And even a lot of the religions that are dying and losing popularity, like Christianity lost a lot of popularity. It was dominant in Europe, it was dominant in North America. But then in the last 150 years, last 200 years, it started going down, losing a lot of its followers. In Europe, it lost 80% of its followers, right? What kept a minority among the Christians faithful to their religion? It's the spiritual side of it. The spiritual side of it. So you find spirituality in all traditions, in all cultures. Humans cannot s survive without this because that's the call of their heart. Their souls require an expression. They require to be tended to. So they vie for this kind of expression and attention. So people need to do this. Even atheists today, I said atheists, even atheists, they don't detach from spirituality. They're waging war against religion and against people who believe in God and people who follow faiths and they try to ridicule try to use science and create arguments and so, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, atheists themselves, they say spirituality is good. Spirituality is good. And I mentioned previously that amongst the, uh, the what they call the militant atheists or agnostics are the ones who are very aggressive against followers of religion are people who are acknowledging spirituality and the value of spirituality and they're actually writing and creating programs for people to be more spiritual but without religion. Because you cannot go against spirituality. No human being would want to go against, against spirituality. So I mentioned, for example, Sam Harris, the one who wrote The End of Faith, which is one of the most influential books that are written in atheism. And he himself is a very vocal person against religion and people who follow religion. Uh, he, we said he wrote a book and he said, spirituality without religion 
how to be spiritual. Because even in science today, as they study well-being and happiness and longevity, uh, they realize that spiritual people live longer, they are healthier, they have high, higher levels of uh, self-esteem, higher levels of well-being, higher levels of happiness, uh, they are more productive than others. This, this, is, this is all scientific experiments. These are all scientific experiments. Now, specifically, positive psychology has been doing a lot of focus there. So they find people that are more spiritual. They actually they have, have higher quality of life. They have more emotional balance. And they live longer. They have happy marriages and happy families. So spirituality, no one detaches from it. Everyone wants it. Everyone wants it. So spirituality is universal. Because it's universal, it gives us common grounds. It gives us common grounds with people. Look at the media. How does it create, how does it portray Islam in a negative light? Does it show spirituality? It doesn't. What does it do? It shows the opposite of spirituality. It shows mercilessness, lack of mercy. It shows savagery in the name of Islam. Under, all, um, under the names of different organizations. They distort Islamic history. They say it's all about killing. They said Muslims just went out of the Arabian Peninsula whacking out other people with their swords. That wasn't the case. That wasn't the case. The whole environment was hostile at that time. All the nations were fighting against one another. That was the case. So for you to take something out of context and say, you know, Muslims, you know, Islam spread by the sword. No, sorry, the language of that whole world at the time was the sword. Everyone is speaking that language. So to put, put Islam in the spotlight and say that's what Islam does, it's all about the sword and spreading by force and neglect to the negligence or to the neglect of the rest of the context, this is absolutely, this is proper manipulation and propaganda. So how, do, how does the media or those opponents of Islam, how do they try to push people away from Islam? By what? Creating a non-spiritual image of Islam. That's it. Creating a non-spiritual image of what Islam is. That's it. So they say Islam is all about killing. Islam is all about, is, is a cult. Islam is all about, you know, being uh, or self-centeredness. Muslims are only worried about themselves. Muslims want to take over the world. Okay. Obviously, this is not, none of this is spiritual. But they never show that Muslims are devout. Or they rarely show that Muslims are devout human beings. That Muslims enjoy their spirituality and their connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Muslims, they want goodness for people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the Prophet ﷺ, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We are the followers of the Prophet ﷺ. We're supposed to be mercy to the world. We don't want to, we don't want any harm to anyone in the world as Muslims. That's what Islam tells us. We want mercy to the world. We want people to open up to the truth. We, would, we wish to share with them the truth. And we want good for them. That's what Islam offers. As simple as that. And the Prophet ﷺ says, أَحَبُّ النَّاسِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَنْفَعُهُمْ لِلنَّاسِ The one, the human being that is dearest to Allah, that Allah loves the most, is the one that is more beneficial to, to humanity. Not even the Muslims, to humanity, to human beings. Even the Prophet ﷺ said, not only humanity, even animals, any created thing, even trees, even the environment. The Prophet ﷺ says, فِي كُلِّ ذَاتِ كَبِدٍ رَطْبَةٍ أَجْرٍ In every living creature, there is reward. And we know the hadith of a, a woman who was actually a prostitute. She had been a prostitute, but she saw a dog that was thirsty and couldn't drink water. And it helped that dog you know, quench its thirst. So it offered water. She offered water to the to the dog, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, "Allah forgive her, forgive, forgive her sins, and allowed her into paradise because of helping that dog." And the man who helped, and another woman entered the hellfire because she kept a cat in a room without offering it any kind of nutrition or food or drink until it, it died. That's part of spirituality of Islam. That's part of spirituality. So spirituality is universal. When you speak to non-Muslims, especially those who are anti-Muslim, have this kind of anti-Muslim spirit, if you really speak with them, they think that Muslims are out there to destroy the world. 
They truly believe so. The other day there was, uh, there was something about Muslim refugees, or Syrian refugees who are in the United States. And I think that was the, uh, what is it, the page on Facebook, Humans of New York. It's, it's very popular. So the guy goes about, you know, meeting different people. So he was talking about refugees in the U.S. And now he's been, recently I believe he was going in, uh, in states that, are f that fully or almost fully support uh, Donald Trump. So he wants to see what these people think about these policies and about all of this. Uh, one of the aspects was anti-Muslim spirit or hate against Muslims. So he was talking to a principal, a lady, the principal of a school. And she was talking about Muslim refugees who just came to, or Muslim students who came to her school. She says, I really feel bad when I see a Muslim kid is being bullied. I really feel bad. But I still think, but I don't say anything because I think these people are a threat to our country. These people are brainwashed. <laughs> they are brainwashed. Brainwashed how? They've swallowed hook, line and sinker the impression that Muslims are out there to conquer the world, to annihilate everyone else, wipe them out from the, from the face of earth. So they believe that's what Islam is about. This is, they believe this is what Muslims want to do. This is why Muslims are there. They just want to kill everyone. Is this spiritual? Absolutely not spiritual. But if we Muslims, and the problem, and I here I want to be critical of ourselves as well. Critical of ourselves. A lot of what we say in our khutbahs, in our classes, is actually is outdated as a discourse, not as a content. Muslims came to the West in big waves in the 1960s, 50s, maybe starting 50s, 60s, 1970s, 1980s, towards the second half of the 20th century. They came to Europe, to North America, to Australia, and they were offered refuge. They were offered citizenship, and they were treated like everyone else, at least uh, formally, they were treated like everyone else. Okay, they were given their rights and everything. What did Muslims do? Instead of Muslims addressing issues that were facing them in the Muslim countries, Muslims brought the issues they had in their homelands, political issues, politi political problems, military struggles, and so on and so forth, and brought them, and the khutbahs at that time were exactly a copy of the khutbahs in the Arab world. That's, that's against wisdom. That's against wisdom. When you live in a country like this, you are supposed to address the concerns of the Muslims, the population there. Help people live Islam. But the khutbahs were highly political. And this is why, straight away, that separated the Muslims from others. Separated the Muslims from others because others saw Muslims were only concerned about their problems in their homelands. They were not part and parcel of this. They don't care about here. They don't care about here. That's the impression they got. S second of all, Muslims themselves were not given guidance as how to maintain the Muslim identity, their Muslim religion, their Muslim practices while living in a Western environment. They were not given, offered that in a practical fashion. Rather, Muslims were always rallied around political issues. These political issues are legitimate. But the question is, was it wise to make these issues the dominant or make them dominate the scene and dominate the khutbahs and the speeches and the whole you know uh, atmosphere of the muslims in the west when the muslims needed to you know live a muslim life in a non-muslim country so that sent a strong message to non-muslims and that also got the muslims to be completely completely consumed with political issues struggles that are justified right but they these issues or being stuck with these issues here made no service to the muslim communities here on the contrary muslims started to take a stance of animosity against everything that was non-muslim and muslims were taught as well that you cannot actually actually preserve your islam if you mix with people so muslims tried to live in their own areas create some you know ghettos pigeonholes just for Muslims to live in okay and separate from everyone else Muslims wanted to live 
exactly the lifestyle that they had in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Pakistan, and in India, and in Somalia, and in Algeria, and in Turkey. They wanted to bring exactly the same thing. Even when these things were cultural, not necessarily Islamic. Not necessarily Islamic. So all of this has, what did it do? It created a, la a layer, an out outer layer, a shell outside that separated the Muslims from the other people and it sent a strong message we are different than you we don't want to be with you you live your life we live our life we live we have here pockets of Saudi Arabia of Pakistan of Egypt of Iraq and so on and so forth here and we're gonna live in our bubble and now now that put the Muslims at a very weak position so when they are being attacked when they're the reputation has been tarnished when they have been misrepresented. Muslims are trying to get out of this bubble. We're trying to undo the work that has been going on for about 50, 60 years. And we're paying for it now. And we scream, no, Islam is not like this. Sorry. <laughs> wakey, wakey, sleeping beauty. 50 years sleeping in your bubble. Now you want to convince, you want us to believe in you? We haven't seen you. Where have you been? Now, people are not saying this openly, but this is how groups think. This is how nations and societies think. This is how we think. You've been around us for 50, 60 years. You never helped out in anything, unless it was about Muslims. Muslims care about humanity. <laughs> I don't believe that. Someone is going to say, I don't believe this. Because you only speak out when it's about your rights as a Muslim minority, right? What about other people's minorities? No, we don't, we don't care about this. But you want others to care about you. Then you say, we care about humanity, we care about other human rights, and we are there for the welfare of the overall society, and so on and so forth. People are seeing through this. And the problem, maybe at some time, we're safe because no one was picking on this. But there are people who have learned from this history, recent history of the Muslims in the West, and they are picking on these points. Our kids were getting in, and this one, that, that's also creating a problem. It's not creating a problem, but people are capitalizing on it, and Muslims are really stuck with it. They, they don't know how to deal with this, right? Uh, this issue of the uh, Muslim prayer, the Friday prayer in the schools, right, in Mississauga and Peel District, this, with the education board. All this issue and all of this anti-Muslim hate and anti-Muslim wave about Muslims, we, they should, we should not accommodate their religious practices in schools. It, these are uh, what it, secular schools. We should not allow all of this stuff. Why give them exemptions? Why give the Muslims a privilege? And so on and so forth. And these Muslims, what is the main point that has been used against the Muslims is what? Is that these khutbas have been used for hate speech. So why do we make our kids for the last 30, 40 years they get and they speak in the school and they talk about what? They talk about their own colleagues, right? Other people of other faith. People of other faith. Talk about them in a very condescending fashion, right? Talking about people who follow other faiths in a very condescending fashion. Now these guys are picking on this. They say we have a long record of Muslims speaking against. They say, okay, we want social cohesion. Want the over, well, overall welfare of Muslim of the of the Canadian society, of the American society, of the British society, of Australian society, right? But look at the speeches that your kids are sharing. Where are they getting this from? It's all about you know condemning other religions, speaking ill about them, right? And this is why the Arabs say li kulli maqamin maqal, li kulli maqamin maqal. You know, for every situation, there is right speech. There's something to be said and something that cannot be said. And this is why in, in, in the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about His words. And this is why the scholars say there are two things that have to combine in anything you say in order for you to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two conditions in whatever you say. And they are found in a verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا and the word of your Lord has been fulfilled, has been completed. Sidqan in truth, wa adla. Adil what? Is justice. And it's also appropriateness. 
That's what Adil in Arabic also means. So this is why it's not only truth, the words of Allah are truth. But Allah didn't say, وَتَمَّتْ كَلِمَةُ رَبِّكَ صِدْقًا and that's it. He didn't say only in truth. What did Allah also say? صِدْقًا وَعَدْلًا In truth and appropriateness. So it's not enough for you to say the truth. You have to say it at the right time, to the right people in the right manner. This is what Adil is. This is why the scholars say, حَتَّى يُقْبَلَ الْكَلَامِ that's what the fuqaha say. And for the words to be accepted, لا بد أن يكون الكلام حقا وعدلا. It has to be truthful. What you say has to be true, and it has to be appropriate to the situation. Has to be appropriate to the situation. An example of this is in marriage. Is in marriage. A husband is upset with his wife for something she said. He feels upset, but he tries to be nice, but she picks on it, she realizes, okay, you're upset about something, tell me. He says, no, 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 I, I, we don't need to talk about this now. She says, no, no, tell me, you have to tell me, right? So he says, I have to be truthful to my wife, I'm going to tell her. If he does that, sorry, he's an idiot. He's an idiot. Why? Because she says, just tell me, we're going to deal with it. She tells her, she's upset, she doesn't want to talk to him, and it escalates and it gets worse. This is how a lot of the misunderstanding and arguments happen. Sometimes it leads to divorce and marital relationships. Why? Because yes, you said the truth, but it's not adil. It is, it is haq, but it's not adil. It's true, but this is not appropriate. Someone does something wrong. They are very sensitive in that situation. You go and tell them that's wrong. What you said is truth, but it's inappropriate. You should wait. When that person is ready, his emotions are stable, he's more centered, so when you tell them and in a good manner, they're more likely to take it. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the believers, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْوًا بِغَيْرِ عِلْمِ Don't speak ill of what? The false gods of the people of Quraysh who worship idols. Don't talk about the asnam. Don't curse them because the Prophet ﷺ, he used to curse the asnam by the way, at the beginning. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to them, don't do that. Lest, what? They're going to swear at Allah. They're going to speak bad about Allah. So, yes, I mean, you're going to say, these are, you know, what? They are stones. They don't benefit you. These are nothing, right? If you say this, it's true, right? These are doomed. These are cursed that you worship them. These are nothing. Allah will put them in the hellfire. It's true. But when you say it to someone, he's going to re reply back swearing at Allah, using bad words about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then you will not be rewarded, rather you will be held accountable for what you caused. This is why the Prophet also said, uh, I can't remember the exact wording of the hadith, but he says about uh, how evil the person is who curses his own mothers, his own mother or his own father. People said, like, they, they thought that was strange. Like, who would curse their own mother and their own father? Like, because they were very loyal, right, to their parents. The Prophet ﷺ, You curse someone's father, he replies to you. He curses your father, so you have cursed, you have cursed your father. You have cursed your own father when you cursed his own father. And this is why you disrespect yourself when someone is... Uh, like a person, an immature person, he's misbehaving, you go and tell them off, he's going to come, have a come back at you, right? You tell him an idiot, he's going to tell you you're stupid. So you put yourself in a bad position, right? So the same thing, so when you say something, it has to be true, and it has to be appropriate. So again, that, I want to take this back to spirituality, is that we were not, we only take, we took one part of Islam, which is mainly the political struggle that the Muslims and uh, Muslim countries are going through, and we said that's what Islam is about. That's the that's only thing we taught our kids. That's the only thing we taught our kids. That was the only thing on their mind. They knew Islam is about what? The struggles that are happening in the Middle East and in Kashmir and in different parts of the world, right? And what happened? That's what our kids know about Islam. That's all what they talk about and so on and so forth. But we, by doing this, we have pushed aside a very important aspect of Islam, which is connection to Allah, the love of Allah, the spirituality that is more likely to open the hearts of people because we said it's, again, the point, it's universal. 
I remember I was last year in Malaysia and they have in uh, there's Nottingham University in the UK it has a branch in Malaysia in Kuala Lumpur uh, so there was a Muslim Awareness Week and the brothers have been struggling a lot because the majority of the students there are Chinese some of those rich wealthy Malaysians who are not so much into religion and uh, some Westerners and some Westerners so they were, they were having a hard time communicating the message Commun uh, talking about Islam because people you know, are affected so much by the media there is an issue in Malaysia between Chinese and the Malay that for the Chinese they think Islam is an ethnic group somehow they know it's a religion but they're just in Malaysia for them the way they understand it politically the way it's been put you're either, you're either Muslim or Chinese that's how it is for them so for them to be Chinese and Muslim is a contradiction it doesn't make sense so it's difficult for them to even think or consider Islam uh, so and there is actually a good uh, percentage of Indian students as well uh, Hindus and, and, and some Muslims so there was a Hindu guy who was a practicing Hindu but he converted to, uh, to Buddhism and some people have known him for a while for three years there and he's been attending these Muslim Awareness Weeks and he's not like it doesn't interest him so much he didn't find anything so I remember one of the brothers he said you know some of the things you talk about actually might resonate with this person so what we did we had a conversation with that person in the coffee shop we sat, I sat with him and we spoke about things and I explained to him about Islam and spirituality in Islam and he says I never knew Islam was like this he says, he says that makes so much sense to me and a lot of what you're saying I already have it in my life but I told him the biggest difference is what? you're experiencing spirituality but with who? he says with God, I said who's God for you? he says God is everywhere God is in everything and I said that's where Islam differs that's where Islam differs. I said Islam recognizes that God is the creator and we are the creation. He says, but we say that God is in everyone. So God is in you and you have to come back to God in you. I said for us, what's in you is not God. What's in you is the creation of God and that's your soul. And your soul recognizes God and loves Him and connects to Him and yearns to Him. And when you come back to your soul and nourish it, and you nourish it with the words of God, that's when your soul is going to fly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you make it to Allah before you leave this world. You make it to God before you leave this world. And that's where the beauty comes. So he says, but like that, that puzzled him a little bit. I said, you know why? Because when you say God is in everyone, what about these people who are killing others? And I said, you're a Buddhist, right? He said, yes. But it was a one form of Buddhism. So I told him, well, what are Buddhists doing, doing to Muslims in uh, Burma? Is that spirituality? And it's one of their main leaders, right? The main spiritual leaders who are inciting all of this hatred. He said, well, I don't believe in that form of Buddhism. I, I have a different version of Buddhism. I said, fine. But these people are spiritual and they are doing these things. So who is doing these things? Is it God in them? He said, no, it's the devil in them. I said, so God and devil are inside that person? So he said, I don't have answers for these. I said, no problem. But we have a lot you have seen that your spiritual quest, I appreciate that you have these tendencies and you're looking forward to fulfill that. But I'm telling him it's going to be deficient, it's going to be problematic until you direct it to the true God and that's your creator. You need to recognize the separation between you and God. Because claiming to be God yourself, that gives you a, a merit or a privilege that you have not earned. You are given a privilege being the creation of Allah, being the special creation of Allah, having this soul blown into you that brings you back to Allah, yearns to Allah. But you have to do your part. You have to do your part to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let your soul be connected to Allah for eternity. And that's your challenge in this life. So we left, we, we parted at that, but he saw so much in common. So after this, the brother says he was asking a lot of questions more about Islam. So the thing is, Buddhism gained a lot of popularity in the Western world in the last 20, 25 years. 
it gained a lot of popularity. A lot of people actually became, a lot of Westerners, like either atheist, agnostic, or Christian, they actually converted to Buddhism. Why? Because of the spiritual aspect of it. Spiritual aspect of it. And the Buddhists have done quite a good job to sort of neutralize Bud uh, Buddhism. They've neutralized Buddhism. In a sense, Buddhism has, is, has a lot of baggage within it. So what they did, they removed a lot of the cultural stuff, a lot of the things that don't make sense, okay, intellectually don't make sense, especially go into contradiction with science. They have stripped those down, and they kept the essence of spirituality that Westerners can relate to. This actually, to a certain extent, purified Buddhism of a lot of nonsense, by the way. It was a very good reform in Buddhism. It made it better, okay, more digestible. And that's why you have with the Dalai Lama, right? He's, he's leading this movement now, and he's creating a lot of popularity for that kind of Buddhism. But the problem is, when people get in Buddhism these days, they are shown a lot of the spiritual aspects and so on and so forth, but it's only later on until they get more into Buddhism that some of the tenets of Buddhism start actually showing up. Okay? And so not all of those are actually pleasant to many people. So some people have left Buddhism again. The point is here, again, Islamic spirituality is authentic, is very powerful, is very ethical and universal. So it is our bridge to other people. It is our bridge to other people. Most of the people have negative opinions about Islam. They have no clue about the spiritual side of Islam. So imagine if, if we connect to people based on these qualities of Islamic spiritualism. It's, it's universal, everyone recognizes it, it resonates with everyone. Everyone, when they see this form of spirituality, it resonates with them. They recognize it in themselves, or they recognize themselves in it. They see the connection, and so they are drawn into it. Second thing, it's ethical. So when it's ethical as well, it helps us connect with people, because we said everyone is, is drawn into this ethical nature. When they see bravery, when they see love, genuine love, unconditional love, when they see respect, when they see justice, when they see selflessness, when they see altruism, when they see noble you know, character and husnul khuluq, everyone is drawn into this and they recognize it and they identify with it because it resonates with the fatrah. So that's a very powerful thing that Islam offers, or Islamic spirituality offers today to the Muslims. So I personally believe the future for da'wah, future for da'wah is more with spiritual, Islamic spiritualism. It's more with Islamic spirituality. Why? And it has to be authentic. It has to be authentic. Otherwise, we'd be taking away people from a misunderstanding into another misunderstanding. It has to be authentic spirituality that's based on the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What does spirituality has to offer us as well? And uh, here I'm specifically going to talk about Muslims, not necessarily non-Muslims. How, how does, what does it have to, to offer to the world? We spoke about ethical issues which are helpful to the Muslims and also helpful in our da'wah. We spoke about the universality which helps us in connecting to others and helping them understand Islam. But there is also something else that Muslims can benefit from when it comes to spirituality. Spirituality gives you peace of mind. It's the sweetness. And in the midst of all these troubles that Muslims are going through, and in the midst of negative cultures, our cultures in the, in the majority of the Muslim world are very negative, extremely negative, and they are not based on Islam. They are not based on Islam. A lot of the attitudes among Muslim communities, Muslim cultures, are very negative, judgmental to others. Starting with the little kids, a child, a little infant, three months old, if he cries excessively, mother and father, uh, mother and father take offense. Take offense. And they start judging the child, that's a troublemaker. From, from that young age, we start making conclusions, arrive at conclusions when it comes to people. Someone you have uh, one first interaction with one person, somehow this person wasn't feeling well that day, straight away you arrive at a conclu conclusion, you judge that person. A person walks into the masjid, you're gonna look him from head to toe, 
You're going to judge him based on how he looks, his clothes, how he walks. Okay, you're going to look down upon him straight away. That's very common. Among Muslim, generally among Muslim gatherings, and non-Muslim gatherings, but now I'm being self-critical. Among Muslims as well, because we don't, that comes against spirituality. You, among Muslims, you don't feel safe. You don't feel safe because you're gonna, you will be picked on. You will be criticized. You will be judged. You will get all of these weird looks. That's usually the case, so you don't feel safe. Some people are not, by the way, not emotionally sensitive enough. They don't feel it. They don't care about it. But people who are sensitive, they know it. They feel intimidated. There's a lot of intimidation. There's a lot of judgment. You have to say things in a certain way, and you have to say certain things. You have to behave in a certain way. And if you do not you know, match this kind of description, okay, you'll be judged. You'll be ostracized. You'll be criticized. You'll be looked down upon. You'll be told off. This is part of our negative culture. We Muslims, when something bad happens to me, why is Allah punishing me? Allah is not punishing you. That's how the world functions. <laughs> Welcome to the world. That's how the world goes. Oh, it's maybe because I didn't do Qiyam al-Layl. Allah is going to punish you because you don't do Qiyam al-Layl. Qiyam al-Layl is not even an obligation. How often I hear this? How, how often I hear this? Someone is saying, you know, my studies are going bad. My fa family is breaking up. I'm losing my kids. I'm losing my job. Maybe because... I haven't been doing Qiyam al-Layl. Qiyam al-Layl is a sunnah. <laughs> so maybe Allah is punishing me. Don't you realize this is a negative thought about Allah? That's, his, uh, that's baseless, untrue. The Bedouin came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, What is upon me? The Prophet ﷺ said, You, you pray five times. You, you bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped, but Allah and that I'm the Messenger of Allah. What else? He says, Five daily prayers. He said, What else? You fast Ramadan. He said, what else? He said, you pay your zakah from your surplus money. He said, what else? In some narrations, it says you make pilgrimage, hajj. He said, what else? He said, la alayk illa anta tawwa. There's nothing more except if you want to do extra. Volunteer and do more. The man said, wallahi, la af'alannaha wa la azidu, wa la, wa la azidu ala dhalika abad. I'm shall, I shall do this, wallah, but I'm not going to do anything extra. That's what I'm going to do. The man walks away, the Prophet ﷺ says, Aflaha and Sadaq. The Prophet ﷺ says, if he sticks to what he said, he's going to be successful. And now we come in, Allah is punishing me because I don't do Qiyam al layl That's not Allah that the Prophet ﷺ told us about, or that the Quran tells us about. See? So this negativity has colored our lives. Colored our lives. There's a child, he's 12 years old, he hasn't memorized maybe three, four surahs. And uh, it happened in front of me. Someone asked him, uh, how old are you? I'm, I'm 12. How many surahs have you memorized? I memorized 10. What are these 10 surahs? Surah Al-Feel, Qul Allah wa Ahad, Qul A'udhu Barabbil Falah, the shortest surahs. <laughs> he says, my child has memorized 10 Jews. Man, take it easy on the child. Take it easy on the child. Why, why do we have to judge? Why do we have to compare? You have an argument with, not argument, you have a, like an interaction with someone, right? And you say, you know, you just said, maybe you were late. Okay, just for, for argument's sake, you were late. You said, oh, sorry, you know, I, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, I had to deal with, I was delayed by traffic, there was traffic, something. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, you just don't care about the, our appointment. No, bro, I'm telling you the truth. No, 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 you don't. You, you just don't appreciate this kind of appointment. Okay, I know, I know it. You don't care about me. Brother, take it easy. I'm telling you with my own tongue that it was traffic. Right? I'm telling you the truth. No, 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 no. So, this kind of argument, and this basically being focused on being right. I want to be right at all costs. It's like walking on a rope. With any mistake, you're going to lose it all. There are people who are like this. Like, there are people who ask questions, okay? And I see this on a daily basis. People ask questions. And they're going to say, by the way, I don't mean this. Don't get me wrong with that. They're so paranoid of making one mistake. Of making one mistake. They're so keen on being right. 
They're so keen on being right. And if they catch you making a mistake, man, you're up for a really hard time. I'm telling you, you, they'll give you a hard time. Why? Because they'll be happy you made a mistake, they didn't make a mistake, and you have to deal with it now. So people are paranoid, they don't want to make a mistake, they don't want to say anything wrong. And if they some, say something that's wrong, no, no, I don't mean this, they panic straight away. Why is there so much focus on being right? Feeling threatened. Under so much threat, you don't feel secure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ghafoorun raheem. Inna Allah azza wa jal qad rafa'a an ummati al-khata' wa al-nisyan wa mastukrihu alayhim al The Prophet says, Allah has forgiven my nation, my people, you know, whatever they make mistakes in. If it's a mistake, you didn't mean it, it was wrong, that's fine. Why panic? You have to be right. Oh, sometimes people in the choice of words. Oh, I, I chose the wrong word. I don't mean this, I mean that. Take it easy, brother. And there are people that, like, and this happens a lot on social media. Someone says, like, you write something on Facebook, Twitter, etc. And someone writes a comment. And what it is, like you say, for example, uh, this journey, or this life is a journey to Allah. He says, yes, and the way you make this journey is by waking up in the night and by fasting day, uh, two days in the week and by pushing against your desires and by putting yourself down. And he writes a whole prescription. Then you say, Jazakallah khair, brother, but it could be much easier. And he's going to come back at you, right? And he says, do you mean I'm wrong? What do you mean by it's easier? The Prophet ﷺ says, Ala inna ghaliya, ala inna You know, the commodity that Allah offers is so expensive. It's Jannah. And you, you're motoring it down, you're making it easy. Why? He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to be wrong. He doesn't want to any kind of criticism or other opinion. If someone has another opinion, people panic. No, it's wrong. That's wrong because that's hadith, that's the verse. Take it easy, brother. You understand the hadith in one way. But there's another way to understand this hadith, right? And this, that's not from me, that's from great scholars, that even from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. So take it easy. Feeling threatened, this kind of negativity, what does it do? It takes away spirituality. When you are focused on being right, so much on being right, you're very defensive, you're very under so much pressure and tension, Sorry, you can't even focus on your soul or on your heart. And it's the heart that matters. It's the heart that matters. And there are scholars, uh, yesterday Sheikh Abdul Mun'im quoted uh, one thing from uh, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali in his book, Ta'if al Ma'arif. He said, you know, what really matters with Allah is the heart. All the acts of worship, the prayer, the fast itself, the reality of them, they were all designed for the sake of your heart. But we are busy so much with the external part of it, which we are supposed to pay attention to, but it should be proportionate. The impact on the heart, that's the most important. That's why the Prophet ﷺ says, Sahih Muslim, Inna Allah la yandru ila suwarikum wa ijsamikum. Allah doesn't look at your externals and how you look like and your bodies. And that excludes external actions. Allah does consider them, but that's not exactly, that's not the focus, that's not the most important thing. وَلَكِنْ يَنْظُرُ إِلَىٰ قُلُوبِكُمْ He looks at your hearts. Other, another wording within Sahih Muslim as well. قُلُوبِكُمْ وَأَعْمَالِكُمْ And the scholars say أَعْمَالِكُمْ أَعْمَالُ الْقُلُوبِ Second, أَعْمَالُ الْجَوَارِحِ The actions of the heart first, and the actions of your body and limbs second. So again, uh, we said spirituality, what can it do? It can benefit the Muslims in increasing the quality of their life. The quality of their life. A lot of Muslims are living under this kind of negative culture, uh, under this kind of negative influence. They want to be right all the time. Okay, they don't want to make any mistake. They feel, you know, under threat. They feel intimidated. Uh, there are high expectations. We think we have to meet the expectations of everyone around us. Otherwise, we would disappoint them. And it's not good. You're not a good Muslim if you disappoint people around. So sell your life. Yeah, and sell all your plans. Trade them off with pleasing people around. With, and there are parents who go to their sons who are married and they tell them, you know, divorce your wife, I don't want her. Or the mother, the mother-in-law goes to the husband, I don't like your wife, divorce her. She's a good woman. She's a righteous woman. She looks after her husband. She's, she's, a, she's like an ideal wife. She hasn't done anything wrong. No, I don't like her, divorce her. Allah says, you have to obey me, right? 
these are negative cultures. They don't doesn't necessarily take this kind of obvious, blatant shape, but it happens. It happens often. So Muslims under these difficult circumstances in the Muslim countries, and now even Muslims in the West are under so much pressure. Muslims living in negative cultures. What can enhance the quality of their life? What can? It's this spiritual side. This spiritual side. You know when you have tawakkul, that's spiritual. You cannot have tawakkul in your mind, by the way, because your mind depends on your senses. It can only see what is, physically. Tawakkul comes from the heart. It comes from the heart, and that's from your soul. Why? Because it's part of the unseen, and your soul has access to the unseen world. It knows that my provision is going to come to me. It's on its way. I don't see it. I don't know where it's going to come. But I know it's going to come because Allah has taken care of it. I know. So I see it in my heart, but I don't see it with my eyes. I don't have any record of it, but I'm sure of it. And this is why I believe Al-Hassan uh, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, At-tawakkul an takuna akthara thiqatan bima yadillah, bima fi yadillah, minka bima fi yadik. He says, real tawakkul is that you trust What's in the hands of Allah, the provision that Allah has in store for you, more than you trust the money you have in your hand already. So you have more certainty in your soul than you have certainty in your eyesight, in what you physically possess. So spirituality has this powerful uh, element of elevating or enhancing the quality of our lives. This is why, probably one of the reasons why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Qiyam al-Layl obligatory upon the early Muslims. Because they were facing extreme hardship. What was the best time for them? When they prayed at night. Connect to Allah. Connect to Allah. The Prophet ﷺ would be weeping. He would be enjoying these verses and reciting this Qur'an. His heels would crack. Yet he, the Prophet ﷺ, would pray more and more. But Bilal says, Ya Rasulullah, Why do you do this, O Messenger of Allah? Allah has forgiven all your sins. The Prophet ﷺ says, Shall I not be grateful, a grateful servant to Allah? Because he finds sweetness and peace in that. Then one day Aisha radiallahu anha, she checks the Prophet ﷺ when she extended her hand and she touched him. The Prophet ﷺ, what did he tell her? He says, Ya Aisha. Varini abud Rabbi. Aisha, let me worship my Lord. Leave me to worship my Lord. Imagine a man after like a difficult day, very busy day, like their heart and their sweetness and their peace is in spending time with the wife, with their wife, especially if they love her. Like the Prophet of Aisha, he found so much peace with her. When a man asked him, Man ahabbun nasi ilayk, who's the person that you love the most? Amr ibn al-As asked him, who's the person that you love the most? He said, Aisha, <laughs> my wife. So the Prophet ﷺ loves her so much, then at night she wants to spend time with, with him. He says to her, Ya Aisha, darini a'bud rabbi. Leave me, leave me, Ya Aisha, to worship my Lord. Leave me alone with Allah, please. That's my, that's my thing. Leave me alone with Allah. So that's the Prophet ﷺ, he himself. Abu Bakr anhu, like the people of Quraysh were really like, fed up with him because he would pray in his house, in the garden of his house, he would pray and he would be weeping and crying and their women and their children would come and have a look at him. He would be a scene for people. But he had no clue about them. He would just pray because he was be weeping. And he was like absorbed in the beauty of the Quran. That enhances the quality of our lives. And you know it when you have a moment of khushu' and salah, you're reciting Qur'an, you are absorbed in this verse, and it grabs your heart, you know how sweet that is. And you strive to get it back, and you wish it can come back and come back, but you don't get it, right? This sweetness takes away all your worries, all your pains. But we have a very poor spiritual repertoire, because we have not tapped into it. We're all concerned about being right. There are people who pray, they want to pray the sunnah. We should all pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed as he said, right? It's an obligation, we have to pray as the Prophet ﷺ prayed. So, somebody, and it happens. Sometimes a person prays next to me and they're praying like a robot. Like they're going to do like this. Brother, the Prophet ﷺ said, yeah, is how he put his hands up, Allahu Akbar, around his shoulders or his earlobes. 
Allahu Akbar. But it's not like you have, your fingers have to be 90 degrees, your palm has to be 90 degrees, and it has to be like in a robotic manner, and like this. And Brother, take it easy, you're a human being. You're a human being. The Prophet when he prayed, he puts his hands up, fine. But it's like, hands have to be like this, stretched. This is exaggeration. This is waswasa. This is ghulu. This is ghulu. And the thing is, when you see the scholars, if you see so Sheikh Ibn Uthameen and Sheikh Al-Bani praying, they didn't do like this. But Allahu Akbar, khalas. Like, it's normal for the hand to be like this, right? That's Allahu Akbar. But you have to say, no, it has to be like this. The thing is, we are so keen, we're so careful to be right in everything. We don't want to be wrong with anything. That we actually go, we do almost everything wrong. Because we're leaning on the other side. You want to keep safe, you're driving on the middle lane, on the highway. You want to keep away from this fast lane, right? Especially, you know, when you, if you go to the UK, you're used to this driving here. You go to the UK, they drive on the upper, opposite side of the road. So you don't know the dimensions of the car right well. Because the steering wheel is on the left side of the car. So you need to adjust, right? So what do you do? You are used to being on the right side of the car and you are used to not leaving enough distance to the car next to you on the next lane. Because you know, you don't, there's no, the body of the car is not on this side, it's on this side. We go to the UK, okay, the body is there. So you're trying to what? Go against your instinct or against your second nature of driving. You try to be on the lane on the other side because you are used to be on this side. Why? To make it up for your natural tendency now. But you find yourself actually on the line on your left. That's the problem. <laughs> That's the issue with it. So some people are so keen on being right, right? To the negligence of the other side where they do everything wrong from the other side. And that's killing our spirituality. We don't have... Prayer is all about, did I do it right? Did I do it wrong? Where is the meanings of Al-Fatiha? Gone. There's more, no meanings. Subhan Rabbi Al-A'la wa bihamdihi. Subhan Rabbi Al-Azim wa bihamdihi. Subhan Rabbi... Does that say three? Has to be three or five, right? And you don't think about the words. You don't think about the words. And then, a lot of people with their obsession, or how do you put your hands out, they start watching everyone around them. Oh, this person does it right, he does it wrong. Does he see how I do it? And so on and so forth. So, okay, easy on yourself. So spirituality can take us out of this. And this is why you find the scholars who are actually tend more to spirituality, you'll find them more accommodating when it comes to fiqh. That's a general phenomenon. And doesn't mean they water Sharia down, on the contrary. On the contrary. But the, the fiqh school or tradition of a person reflects, reflects their personal demeanor as well. So a rigid person will be rigid in fiqh. An easygoing person is going to be easygoing in fiqh. The Prophet ﷺ praised Abu Bakr anhu and Umar al Khattab. He said, Arhamu ummati bi ummati. Abu Bakr And the one that is more strict in the religion Among my ummah in matters of religion is Umar Why? Because that's his natural demeanor That's who he is That's who he is So even the way you practice Islam Is going to show your personality So when a person has A scholar has spirituality He's going to show into his fiqh style He's going to show in his fiqh style so this is why when someone is so much focused on technicality, especially younger students of knowledge or beginners, early students of knowledge in the early stages, when they start focusing on these technicalities to the negligence completely of the spiritual aspect, what did they become? Very judgmental, very critical, very aggressive. Straight away they arrive at conclusion, you're wrong, that's wrong. Why? Because they haven't heard it. You're against the sunnah, you're out of the sunnah, you're this, you're on the manhaj, you're out of the manhaj. Why? Why? Because... This is how they see Islam, very technical, one plus one equals two. Okay. So, whereas, so this, this is a third benefit of spirituality, enhances the quality of our life. And the fourth one is what I concluded with, and that's basically that, uh, as I said, scholars that are known for their spirituality, spir uh, like, and their depth in spiritual issues, and paying attention to spiritual issues, you'll find them more accommodating of al khilaf al mustasakh of differences, that are warranted, not any kind of difference, it has to be warranted. It cannot go against the hadith, against the Quran and the Sunnah. This ikhtilaf is ghayr mustasakh, okay? So these are things that authentic Islamic spirituality 
and matters of the heart, understanding of the matters of the heart, can offer our ummah in these days. And I see that these are actually valuable offerings. So hopefully this will be a, a motivation for us, would prompt us, inshallah, to pay more attention there, knowing that there is authentic spirituality that doesn't fall into bid'ah, doesn't fall into innovation, doesn't fall into mysticism, doesn't fall into any kind of you know, departure from the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, and the tradition of the early generations. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us develop this authentic spirituality within ourselves and help us benefit from it and hopefully will benefit the Muslims. I'll take one question until Sheikh Abdul Mu'am gets uh, his ready. I can't... Yesterday we talked about this. Inshallah in the future. I run out of time. I have one minute. I'm going to give it to one question. That for people to come back uh, and, and go for the spiritual part of Islam, but what we have as a tool right now for Muslims, for new Muslims to to go with it, because we don't have a lot of out there. There's not a lot of knowledge, and there's not a lot of people talking about it. So, how can we achieve this? How can we get in touch and base with our souls? Uh, I think that's a very good question. How? What do we have to offer to new Muslims when they come to Islam or even newly practicing Muslims? Because there are Muslims who haven't been practicing, now they decide to practice. But usually what they are taught is the technical aspects to the negligence of the spiritual aspects or the aspects of the heart. Uh, I think this requires Imams and teachers as well to pay attention first to this, develop it within themselves. Uh, and I think, and I believe in this, and this is why I actually wrote a book in Arabic and hopefully soon inshallah the English version will be uh, translated. It's a, uh, try to make it as accessible as possible to every human being in the, the language, sense of the language is easy. Uh, is when we teach people prayer, for example, new Muslims or new, new practicing Muslims, when we teach them prayer, not only the physical aspect, we should teach them the meanings, the deeper meanings of Salah. And they can relate to these and they actually appreciate it. They appreciate this. Uh, so I think that's the responsibility of the Imams and the scholars to build some kind of system, some kind of introduction around these things. Uh, and I think it's, so it's the awareness, it's the awareness of these things. And I think this is why it requires a teacher there, a teacher in the sense you can see it in their demeanor. Instead of just reading about it, you can see it as a living example, uh, being humanized or person personified in a person where they actually uh, possess and uh, show this kind of spirituality it shows on them. Yeah, so I think it, it's the responsibility of the teachers, the imams. That's what I believe. Barakallah. Okay, Barakallah.